ก็สำหรับเอ่อ so we will start talking in Thai just for a few few minutes okay okay ก็พี่แฟงครับก็สวัสดีทุกคนนะครับวันนี้ก็เป็นไกลกลาครั้งที่สองของเรานะครับเป็นซีรีส์ในการแนะนำนักคิดต่างๆนะครับทั่วโลกนำหนังสือของเขามาพูดคุยกันแล้วก็ประเด็นทางสังคมต่างๆครั้งที่แล้วเราก็เคยจัดไปแล้วนะครับเกี่ยวกับสถานการณ์ในเบลารุสครั้งนี้เราก็จะมาพูดถึงประเด็นที่ผมว่าเด็ก IR หลายๆคนก็น่าจะกำลังอ่านหนังสืออยู่นะครับแล้วก็เป็นประเด็นทางเศรษฐกิจการเมืองด้วยก็คือเรื่องอสังคมนิยมแล้วก็เรื่องเพศนะครับวันนี้เราก็มีศาสตราจารย์ด้านประวัติศาสตร์ด้านรัสเซียศึกษานะครับจะมาพูดถึงความรักในระบบสังคมนิยมว่าแตกต่างกับความรักในระบบทุนนิยมอย่างไรนะครับโดยเธอได้ศึกษาประเทศตัวอย่างหลายประเทศในอดีตอย่างเยอรมันตะวันออกนะครับอันนี้ก็เป็นหนังสือที่กําลังจะเผยแพร่ออกมานะครับซึ่งก็ผู้แปลก็นั่งอยู่ค่อนข้างนะครับจะเป็นคนที่จะมาชวนเราคุยด้วยนะครับรายการนี้จะดําเนินรายการเป็นภาษาอังกฤษนะครับโดยส่วนใหญ่แล้วก็ท่านเพื่อนทั้งหลายก็สามารถที่จะส่งคำถามมาถามวิทยากรได้หลังจากที่พวกเราถามคำถามเพิ่มเติมแล้วนะครับเดี๋ยวผมพูดต่อไปนะครับ,รบจะถามก็เดี๋ยวสำหรับหลังจากเซสชันนะครับหลังจากนั้นไม่กี่วันก็จะเป็นการสรุปนะครับลง Facebook เป็นภาษาไทยเนาะเผื่อใครที่ไม่ได้ตามแล้วก็สามารถติดตามชมไลฟ์นะครับได้ทั้งทาง Facebook Twitter แล้วก็ YouTube ของสโมสรนิสิตรัฐศาสตร์นะครับเออนะครับเดี๋ยวก็ขอเริ่ม introduce นะครับนิดหนึ่งแล้วก็จะส่งให้พี่แฟงนะครับก็ if Everyone joined us today. Episode of Bill Bernerix. Um, I'm aware that many of us are now at the protest against the government, so less people are watching us today. So for those who are watching, you can tell others that there will be um like the the li the recorded live uh, on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, so you can share it after this. Uh, and the summary in Thai language will be also published in several days. Uh, after the session, um, so n a t i v i t the president of Political Science Student Union of j u l a l u n g o n University, we in introduced you the series named b e y o n d b o r d e r i e s in English and k e t k a n o k w o n g s a p a k t i who is the tr translator of the book we are talking about today. We introduce our honourable speaker, uh, and yeah. Chris, of course, Kristen g o s s i who is our speaker today, will start her session. And uh, for the last um, period, like for 15 to 20 minutes, we will have Q and A session from the audience. Okay, so may I please start. Okay, um, hello everyone. I'm n a t i v i t President of Political Science Student Union, j u l a l u m p o r University. Well, warm welcome everybody to the series Beyond Boundaries. 
throughout this year, we will have uh, speakers around the world, academics, politicians, activists, to talk about one of the issues that uh, we, as a global citizens, have to uh, face now today. Um, the first series that we already have is the, about uh, the politics in Belarus. We have Nicholas James, uh, PhD student from Oxford University. Today, um, it's very well, welcome to uh, Professor Gossi. We will talk about um, why women have better sex uh, in socialism. And we also now have a uh, Thai translation of her book, uh, which now I'm um, very, very happy to have her book in Thai. This section will be moderated by uh, Supernat, uh, by my, my friend who, trans, uh, who are the translator of uh, the book and me. Okay, um, um, let's start uh, the, our sessions. So I, I would like to uh, ask the Professor uh, Christian Gossi uh, about um, your, um, your book. And it's a very simple question. Uh, as uh, many people know that um, in our textbooks or in our mainstream media that um, like a sociali socialism, it may be out there uh, thinking. <laughs> it's the, you know, out there um, thought that now people have been um, believe in capitalism. And uh, people think that uh, Eastern Europe, maybe many people also think that Eastern Europe is the fail. We, we don't have anything to learn from them. So, but um, as you, you uh, wrote the book and your title, Why We Have Better Sex, uh, why women have better sex in socialism? I want to ask you about why women have better sex in socialism. Okay, great. So um, first I want to say that I think actually we can learn a lot from Eastern Europe. Uh, it is the part of the world that had the longest experience with state socialism. And the, you know, we are living in a moment right now in the world where we are seeing the failures of capitalism. Uh, the free market economy does not really help us face something like a coronavirus pandemic. Um, and this pandemic comes only uh, 12 years after the Great Recession, the big financial crisis. That really uh, shows that capitalism is having trouble. Uh, the boom and bust cycle is real and many young people are feeling like they need to learn about other ways of organizing an economy and organizing a polity. And so I think that when we are looking at critiques of, of capitalism, when we're trying to understand what the alternatives to capitalism are, we really have to consider socialism. Even though it does feel a little outdated, it is still one of the most prominent and useful tools that we have for understanding the critique of capitalism. And so when we do that, we need to look at Eastern Europe. Now, my personal focus has always been women's rights. And I think one of the things that we can learn from Eastern Europe, in particular, these countries that really promoted women's emancipation and women's equality as part of the socialist vision is that women really did have very good lives prior to 1989 or 1991 compared to what happened afterwards. Now, I'm not saying that everything was you know, wonderful in these countries. There were a lot of negatives. But there were some things that were good. And one of the things that was good about life in these countries was that women had very high levels of economic independence, which allowed them to choose their partners on the basis of love, attraction, and mutual affection, and not based on whether or not that man could pay her bills. And so the argument that I make in the book is that women have much more freedom and liberty when they live in a society with wider social safety nets that allow them to meet their needs through their own efforts rather than relying exclusively on the support of men. Yeah, that's um, uh, like interesting the argument that we cannot find here in 
like in Thai mainstream um, course or textbook, yeah, it, it said that socialism like oppress the liberty of the citizens, yeah. But gladly, um, here in in our faculty, there's a professor who like who bring and teach she teach us the, like um, the critical international relation and like and use your book as the article for us to read and i just learned it like the like the like i think the last the last courses i mean like the last week i just learned uh -huh. about the book so i'm just glad to to <laughs> to meet you and i think um P. Bay Mai or Gaganok gonna ask you some like some interesting questions yeah i mean i do think that you know in my world i have been studying the situation of women in Eastern Europe for about yeah. 20 years, right? So in my world, the kinds of things that I'm saying about socialism are not that controversial. But I know, <laughs> I know that outside of my small academic world, that these that these sorts of things, saying that there were some good things about socialism in Eastern Europe is pretty controversial. However, you know, in addition to the Thai translation, there are now 12 other international editions of the book, including in places like Indonesia, right? And in places like Russia that actually lived under, um, under socialism. So I think that people, you know, it's, I'm just really lucky. I, I, there's a moment right now, in fact, I, the book just came out in Russian. I just a few days ago, it came out in French. So there, there's a moment now when people are really trying to think critically about, yes, okay, there were some really negative things about socialism. Nobody is denying that. But we're living in a moment right now when we're realizing that there are some very negative things about capitalism. And especially <laughs> in the face of the coronavirus pandemic, people are understanding that free markets are not going to get us out of this situation. The free market economy is not the answer to climate change. It's not the answer to automation. And it's certainly not the answer to public health on an international scale. Yeah, so to just talk about the COVID-19, which I am interested in, how the COVID-19 affects women, like under the capitalism and like neoliberal uh, structure currently yeah yeah actually what we're seeing and and we've just seen in the united states in my country in september alone four times more women left the labor force than men because what covid19 has done is it has shown that um, instead of, of, of creating social safety nets to support people, what the economy does is when the economy starts to fall apart and you have um, people that are suffering, all of that labor, all of the care is put on the shoulders of women. So women have to care for the children who are not at school. Women have to care for the elderly relatives who are isolated because of the pandemic. And women have to care for sick people who may or may not be in the hospital, right? Because a lot of sick people are in the hospital when they're in critical condition, but when they come back and they're still sick and they're at home, who is doing the care? It's mostly women. And this is care that the government doesn't pay for, right? This is free labor that women provide to our societies. And so capitalism, for, for, for capitalism, the unpaid labor of women is the backup plan, right? When the economy starts to fall apart, and we've seen this, we see this, we saw this in the Great Recession. We've seen this, you know, during World War II, when the men go away to fight, it's women who have to then leave the home and work in the factories. And then as soon as the men come home, women go back into the house and, and lose their status and their position. So capitalism uses women's labor as a kind of reserve army to support an economic system that exploits everybody, but particularly exploit, exploits the unpaid women um, labor of women. And we're really seeing that very clearly with the coronavirus pandemic. I mean, with COVID-19, you see it in Europe. 
uh, you see it everywhere. This is a this is a real problem because, look, you know, when children aren't going to school, their home, who is teaching those children, who is caring, who is caring for those children? It's largely women who are doing the work. Hmm. Would I ask you about? Um, I want to ask uh, ask you study about um, Eastern Europe history for a very long time. Can mm -hmm. you show about? Um, uh, what are uh, you um, impressive about uh, the uh, government in the past that uh, help, uh, have uh, facilitated to help people in their country? Which, uh, which example do you think that uh, we should uh, follow to? So, I mean, again, I think you have to understand that there's a big difference between uh, sort of a command economic structure where all economic decisions are being made by the state, which is what you have largely in Eastern Europe, where all, all government um, industry was state owned and a sort of more mixed economy, right? Like uh, something like the Hungarian case, what was called goulash communism, right? Because there was state ownership, but there was also a lot of private market. If you look at a place like Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia was very liberal. It was open to the West. People could travel. They had trade with the United States. Even the Soviet Union at different periods of time were, were more open or closed to sort of some kinds of interventions of the market. So, so the one thing that you have to understand when you're looking at Eastern Europe is you cannot look at, you cannot look at communism as one, um, one thing. It was different in different places. And I actually think that that's important to understand, not to mention outside of the Soviet Union, right? Outside of Eastern Europe, if you look at Cuba, or Yemen, or Nicaragua, or China, or Vietnam, right? There are all these different models out there. So the one thing that I think is really important about socialist economies is that they provide a very high level of stability and social security for the population. So they may not have, you know, a hundred different types of, of shampoo for your hair uh, or, or 50 different types of toothpaste for your teeth. You know, in fact, there were real consumer shortages. People didn't have jeans. People didn't have perfume. People didn't have whiskey. People didn't have the kinds of cigarettes that they wanted. But they did have their basic needs. They had food. They had shelter. They had health care. They had education. They had public transportation, largely. They had um, a pretty solid a floor under which most people did not fall, right? So you're talking about um, a, a, a very egalitarian society that has, um, that has, you know, again, a low level of consumption. I don't want to sugarcoat that. I want people to understand that there were sacrifices that were made. But if you look at what's ha what happened after 1989 in these countries was you had incredible inequality and incredible poverty. So a few people got really, really rich, really, really quickly, what we call the oligarchs in Eastern Europe, and millions of people got very, very poor very quickly. And this kind of poverty is unknown in this region where people don't have heat, where people don't have electricity, where people don't have water, where people don't have basic medicine or food. Those are the kinds of things that people had not experienced in this type, uh, in this part of the world. And I think that um, when we look back at that level of social security, what we, what we can say is it doesn't require that the state own all of the means of production, right? There are different ways of getting to that level of social security for the population. And we have to think very critically about what um, is the balance between maybe uh, um, how much taxation and redistribution we want to do on sort of market transactions versus what percentage of the economy should be owned by the state, like utilities, like telecommunications, for maybe the the banking industry. There's lots of different, you know, lots of different people have different ideas about how this works. There's also, you know, the idea that rather than having the state own these things, having people own the, the means of production themselves is sort of a more anarcho-syndicalist model. 
Or you could look at a place like Norway, where they have a sovereign wealth fund, where the government invests in stocks, and then the, the profits that are made from those investments are redistributed to the population or invested in social services. So there's lots of different ways to think about how you do this kind of redistribution. And I think that the most important thing is to, to stop thinking of socialism, the word, as so negative. Because yes, it's associated with negative things in the past, but so is capitalism. And so we need to think creatively. The 21st century provides uh, an opportunity to go back and learn from the past, to get rid of the negative things, and to, to reconsider the positive things that we might be able to repurpose for the challenges that we're going to face in the decades to come. Mm. It's very interesting. Um, so, um, I'm the translator of your work. Um, yes. I'm very, <laughs> of course, I'm very interested. At first, like, I was very skeptical towards, you know, feminism mm. and gender. So I took a course in my faculty and which the pro the professor was a socialist and so yes he well he 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 um assigned me to read your book and i and i thought like it was like the the spiciest book of all like it, it was so controversial and it was you know very socialist and a socialist so i like the book and so i i um, after you know reading your book, I was so, you know, open. My mind was really open because, like, I feel like we, um, we don't talk when we talk about socialism. We only like focus on, you know, um, economic equality, but we barely talk about women. And mm -hmm. I think, like, I think, like, um, it's important when you, you know, study women how 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 their lives are going under different regimes between, like, as a socialist state and capitalist state like it helped me see like a lot of things going on and and actually i was skeptical towards like feminists because like there were so many kinds of feminism like from liberal feminism and to you know eco feminism yes i i didn't really very impressed but with you know socialist feminist i'm so i like it's like i fall in love with it because like it made me see so many things um and actually in thailand um we're discussing we discuss so much about like on patriarchy and like and but actually your book actually says that smashing patriarchy is not enough and and yeah i agree with that because you know there there's you know capitalism going on and capitalism you know exploits women every single day and feminists in Thailand actually are are um, fighting. They're fighting for sex workers, right? They're fighting because like sex work, sex work in Thailand is not is not legal. So they are mm -hmm. fighting, you know, to legalize it. And my question is why, <laughs> why like fighting, fighting for you know sex workers legalization is not enough. Right. Why we and have to like, go beyond that. Exactly. I mean, so so any any, you know, look, all economic activity like work is work, whether it's it's sex work or whether it's, you know, uh, you know, regular labor in a factory or intellectual work. Anytime, you know, uh, an employer is paying you and they're extracting a certain percentage of the surplus value for their profit. Right. It's a relationship of exploitation. Now, some people argue that this is necessary in order to encourage innovation in order to encourage industriousness and some people say that okay maybe a little bit is okay but too much and and the society becomes very unequal and you have these extremes of inequality that make the society unstable and you know the last 250 years of history 300 years of history has really shown that extreme inequality creates uh, um, a lot of instability in society and i'm sure you're under very understanding of this in thailand right now so but but i think that what you're talking about and and i'm very um delighted that the book you know exposed you to the ideas of, of the socialist feminists which go all the way back to the beginning of the 19th century so they've been around for about 170 180 years 
But when we think of feminism, we generally tend to think of sort of liberal feminism. And liberal feminism, or what the socialists used to call bourgeois, bourgeois feminism, is always about expanding women's rights within the framework of capitalism. So feminists can work very well together with capitalists because all they want to do is improve the conditions of certain women's rights. And that could be, you know, that could be sex workers, that could be domestic workers, that could be giving women access to the professions, that could be hoping that there's a woman president or making sure that there are more women CEOs or women on the boards of directors of large corporations. But all of those changes just allow women to participate in capitalism more effectively. And, and in the end, that doesn't really change the underlying dynamic, which is that patriarchy and capitalism work hand in hand together to oppress not only women, but also men. And I think that the most profound insight of socialist feminism is that men and women need to work together. A lot of liberal feminists tend to see men as the enemy. And I think that's very counterproductive because the, 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 the um, alliances between working men and working women are some of the most powerful alliances that have changed the course of history. And what happens is that capital often uses feminism as a way to divide men and women to make the working movement, to make the movement of citizens weaker. Um, and it's a very clever strategy to do that, um, to, to, to divide peoples, to make the issue about, you know, of something very specific, like making sex work legal or improving the conditions of domestic workers or um, increasing women's participation on corporate boards. Now, I'm not saying those things aren't important. They are important, but they're not enough. And ultimately, you're, you're, you're perpetuating a system that really harms people in the long run. And what we need to do now, I think, because we're living in an era where we're facing things like climate change, where we're facing things like extreme income inequality, where we're facing things like automation, these are all problems, or, the, or COVID-19. Again, all problems that the market doesn't seem capable of fixing, we need to think, okay, how are we gonna address these problems outside of the market? And when we, the minute we leave the space of the market, we have to talk about socialism. We have to talk about ways of doing things differently. And, and for women, especially, I think that the kind of socialist feminist perspective or socialist women's perspective, if you don't want to use the word feminist, because I don't think you need that word necessarily. What it allows you to see is that your um, particular form of oppression within the system is not only about patriarchy. Smashing the patriarchy is not enough. It never was. That's why, you know, a hundred years after suffrage in the United States, we still don't have a woman president, right? We still don't have women in very high positions of power. There's still a small percentage. Uh, 50 years after the feminist movement in my country, when the corona, when COVID-19 hits, who are the first people to lose their jobs? It's women, right? Because the structure of inequality and the structure of capitalism has not changed. It's still the same as it was 50 years ago to a certain extent. It's just that, you know, we have more women who are out there in the labor force trying to succeed. But when everything falls apart, it's women who look after the children. It's women who lose their jobs. So we have to think always, I mean, you guys are political scientists, budding political scientists. You have to think about political economic structures in society. You cannot just focus on interpersonal relationships at the, at the private level. Everything is related to politics. And unfortunately, I think a lot of young people today try to distance themselves, right, especially in my country, from politics or the economy because they don't really feel like it's related to their everyday lives. But everything about their everyday lives is being structured by the political economy. And that's 
one of the reasons why I wrote this book is to try to get young people to understand the relationship between your personal life and the political world and the economic world that you live in. Wow, that's very impressive. <laughs> I like it. Um, um, well, that's interesting because I just I personally don't like liberal feminists at all. Like people like you know Sheryl Sandberg and those kind of you know feminists. Right. And um, yeah, and um, then what inspired you to like? to um, write it book because like it's so controversial in so many ways and, <laughs> and, and you know as people are talking patriarchy and smashing patriarchy and stuff but why what inspired you like to to write this book so it was a it was really not my idea <laughs> um <laughs> so there's a, it's a kind of a strange story so um i had written another book that came out in 2017, which was the 100th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. That book was called Red Hangover, and it was about the legacies of communism in the 20th, of, of 20th century communism. So in that book, there was a little essay about a lecture that I had given in uh, Germany about a, a 2007 documentary film called Do Communists Have Better Sex? Um, I encourage you to, to watch it. It's I think it's on YouTube probably. It's a very interesting documentary. Anyway, to make a long story short, during 2017, the New York Times, which is a big newspaper in the United States, did a series of, of columns called uh, The Red Century, and it was, different scholars reflecting on what the legacies of the Bolshevik revolution were today. So they asked me to write a column about women's rights. And I wrote um, a little article about, you know, um, this aspect of, of, of women and women's sexuality. And the New York Times gave it this title why women had better sex under socialism. Now, I didn't know about that title until it was already online, okay? I saw it, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so, and that article, this was August of 2017, that article went all over the world. Um, and a lot of people were talking about it. And one of the um, criticisms, I mean, there were a lot of criticisms, was that in the 1,000 words that I had, I did not fully substantiate my arguments, right? So about a month, I think it was the end of September or maybe early October in 2017, I got a call from a New York publisher and they said, hey, will you write a book about this? And I, at first, was very hesitant because I'm an I'm an academic, I'm a scholar. All of my research is, is is in Eastern Europe and I've been doing this research, like I said, for about 20 years. So I didn't really want to do it because I thought, oh my God, you know, this is this is a weird world out there of, of all these trolls and, and internet people telling me that I should go die and get killed or whatever. Um, but in the end I decided to do it because um, in exchange for the title, this is the, the title was what the publisher wanted. Um, the actual book has, I think, 20 pages of footnotes, of endnotes, right? Uh, of citations to the literature on this topic. So, um, so if you read the book, what you'll see is that there's a lot of empirical evidence out there, right? There have been studies, sociological studies, anthropological fieldwork, historical research that backs up what I'm saying. I didn't just make this up, right? This is actually scientifically researched. And so I felt like after the op-ed was all, you know, this article in the New York Times was already out there, I might as well provide the book 
so that I could show people all of the research that other people, many of my colleagues in Eastern Europe are doing on this topic. So yeah, it's very controversial, but I sort of felt like the once I had the op-ed happened, I, I was already sort of stuck with the topic. So I might as well just do it right the second time. And that's what the, that's how the book came about. Right. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so, um, um, so I see like you, you, it's like, there are a lot of researches cited in the book. So <laughs> obviously you're not, you know, just pop everything up, make, make everything <laughs> up. It's like, yes, when I translate your book, like, I, like I had to you know, tr translate like so many numbers, so many researches. So yes, it was <laughs> kind of, uh, uh, quite like a hard task for me because like there are so many like so many numbers which mm -hmm. shows that you you know you have researched a lot and yes and um and as you as you said that you know you've been you know, writing about socialism and women and what is what is it that you are writing now like what what your work are gonna be yeah, so um, actually right now I am um, working on a book about feminist utopias, actually. So so I'm I'm looking I'm so one of the things that I'm really interested in is not only um, the legacy of socialism, because I think socialism is a is a is an interesting set of, of ideas, and then we can also look at how those ideas were put into practice. But they're there's, first of all, there's a, a division between what people thought would happen and then what actually happened. So we got to keep that in mind. But there's also, you know, a tradition of, of more kind of anarchist ideas around feminism, what, what's called anarcho-feminism, uh, where you don't necessarily have a state that's doing all the redistributing, but you have people who are coming together and they're forming collectivities or they're forming syndicates. And, and, and they're imagining um, a, a new world. So one of the things that I find really interesting is that when we look at utopias going all the way back to Plato in the Republic, right? Or if we look at somebody like Thomas More who wrote um, the book Utopia, he actually coined this word utopia in uh, 1516, I think. Or somebody like uh, Tommaso Campanella, who wrote uh, City of the Sun in 1602. What I find really fascinating is that when, when um, theorists imagine people who hold property in common, people who are living communally, they also tend to imagine women's rights. They tend to imagine women living equally as men, including Plato, which is really interesting. And so, um, and they tend to imagine alternative views of the family. So I'm, what I'm doing is I'm take, I'm looking at people like Alexandra Kolontai and Clara Zetkin and August Babel, some of the people that I talk about in the book, this book, um, but I'm also expanding that out a little bit. And I'm looking at other sort of utopian thinkers, including anarchists, including sort of, um, you know, early political philosophers who weren't necessarily thinking in terms of anarchy, but they're, they, they were creating primitive communes, right? Like Thomas More's Utopia is a communist paradise. You know, there's no way you, Plato's Republic is extremely communistic, right? Um, and, and he liberates women. He believes that women should be guardians. So I'm sort of, uh, what I'm really interested now in, in thinking about is the way that utopian visions of the future uh, not only think about property in common, but also think about equality in a much more expansive way. So I'm sort of, I'm sort of expanding the work that I did on socialism, which was very much about um, very, the practice and the lived experiences of the 20th century state socialism in Eastern Europe. And I'm, I'm moving to kind of the more theoretical level of like, okay, let's talk about these wild ideas that people like, you know, um, like I said, from Plato onward had. People like um, Edward Bellamy uh, in Looking Backward or Charlotte Perkins Gilman in Herland. Um, 
You have in Russia, Alexander Bogdanov writes about a Red Star, about a communist community on Mars, um, where again, you have uh, you know children's colonies and property in common. There's so many interesting examples. Um, Chernichevsky, Nikolai Chernichevsky wrote a book that was very influential on people like Vladimir Lenin called What is to be Done? And in that book, uh, one of the characters, Vera Pavlovna, has the, this dream of a, of a utopian sort of communist society where women are equal to men. It's, there's some really interesting things. And so what I'd love to do now, or I'm thinking about now, especially because I can't travel to Eastern Europe. I'm like stuck because of COVID-19. So the way that I'm using my energies is by reading all of these, these texts. And I'm hoping to sort of write a book that is really kind of a political theory book, but, a, but, a, but a, a political theory book that is sort of more fun and contemporary so that I'm using, I'm talking about Taylor Swift and I'm talking about popular Disney movies and I'm talking about you know the way that utopian visions or optimistic visions of the future are kind of um, influencing youth culture today. Because I think that for a long time, just like socialism is a really bad word, Utopia is a bad word, and I think we need to bring um, we need to bring hope back into our politics. We need to bring radical dreaming back into our politics. We need to bring utopia back into our politics because we're living in a in a, in a world that's changing all around us right now. Everywhere you look, everything is turned upside down, and this is the moment for dreaming. This is the moment for pushing change and really thinking expansively about what we can learn from these past political thinkers. Wow, wonderful. Because, uh, because like, you know, capitalism slowly, and I don't know, slowly, or even I believe like rapidly canceling our future every yes. single day. Yes, every last year, day. like Greta, like Greta Thunberg just, you know, came up and just demand like, the future for for the young generation because you know capitalism destroyed uh, the yeah. nature and now like this year we got COVID nineteen like it's <laughs> capitalism again <laughs> yeah one. no exactly you know I have a, I have an eighteen year old daughter so she's almost nineteen and I I and because she's doing university online you know we're together so I talk to her about a lot of these things and. I think that, um, you know, I've been teaching at a university for over 20 years. And I can tell you that um, maybe, you know, 20 years ago, 20, 15 years ago, there was a lot of apathy among young people. Young people were very frustrated with the world. And, and, and they expressed this frustration through apathy by not caring. And what's happened in the last, I would say, two or three years is that suddenly young people not only care, but they're really angry <laughs> about what's happening in the world. And I think that that's a good thing. I think that, that from that anger can come real progress. But at the same time, I don't think it should only be anger. I think it should be fun. I think it should be uh a playful. I think it should be imaginative. I think people should, um, you know, think about, you know, crazy ideas, you know, let's talk about flying cars and let's talk about um, a world where people have all their property in common. Let's talk about, you know, uh, what it would, what the world would look like if we were seriously going to tackle the problem of, of climate change and, and reduce our consumption, right? So, so yeah, the anger is a good place to start, but let let it also be joyful and let it also be hopeful because I think that anger, if it stays too angry, then it can become something kind of ugly very quickly. And we've seen that from history. So it's the combination of anger and, and, and hope and dreaming and positivity that I think is really important. Yeah, just one more question and we will go for the Q&A session. Yeah, okay. okay. Just yeah, so someone has texted me like they just and here she and me just want to ask a really simple question. Wish to, to answer the, the topic that we have today, like what aspect that women had 
better sex and the socialism like like, like what how like for example yeah, you know like so like so can you explain in brief for just like one to two minutes and we can move to the q and a session sure. so like because if it's too long then they're gonna they are not going yeah. to buy your book okay let me yeah buy your book. <laughs> right yeah so it is yeah. a complicated argument and i encourage you yeah. to read it in full right yeah. um you know so there are there are two parts to this uh one is that in a society where human relationships are not commodified right um we tend to have more authentic relationships with not only our intimate partners, but also our friends and our family. So when, when, when you live in an economy that wants to make everything an economic transaction, that lowers the quality of our interpersonal rela relationships. So that's, that's one thing. And again, that argument is expanded in the book. The second thing is that we also live in an economy where um, these things, right, are competing for our attention all the time. And uh, now capitalism is not only interested in exploiting our labor, but they're also exploiting our attention, our affection, our um, emotions, right? So you think about the work of somebody like Eva Iluz, who talks about emotional capitalism, right, the exploitation. So the feelings that I used to have um, for free are now something that I can sell on the internet, right? Or I can, or that uh, other companies want to capture from me. And I think that we're moving into a phase of capitalism whereby um, human beings are no longer really as valuable for their labor as they are for their emotions and their attentions and their affections. And that really makes um, our relationships with each other very toxic because it means that every, again, every personal interaction between two human beings is mediated by a for-profit corporation, right? That is trying to extract some profit like Tinder or, you know, uh, or fa Facebook or whatever, or Twitter. These are all for-profit corporations that want your attention so that they can show you advertisements to sell you things that you probably don't need, <laughs> right? So, um, so, so, so again, in the book, I go into a much longer discussion of sexual economics theory and, and, and the economic theory of how this actually works. Um, but, the, but the basic argument is that in a socialist society with, or a more socialistic type of society with greater social safety nets, people have less of an incentive to commodify their emotions, attention, and affections for the market. Okay, so thank you. That's a really, like, that's a very brief summary of your book and may fascinate or like, make people wonder and want to read your book more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so, so we can, move to like um, the Q&A session so like people from Facebook live Twitter and YouTube you can like type type in the comment section and uh, I will show it to the screen and yeah so uh, we can answer to that question okay so just wait a few minutes sure no problem I'm sure that okay that's first question for from um Panton Imen Kamon. Okay, Professor Gossip and that the place a rift a lift between men and women. Could you please briefly elaborate on this? Sure. I mean, I think that you know, one of <laughs> this is a this is a um a longer question to answer. So I'm gonna try to keep it brief, right? So initially women's labor was used to um, lower men's wages, right? Women were competition to men in the labor market. Capitalists knew this very early on. 
Um, and in fact, in, in an early stage in, in European industrialization, men were very angry at women for joining the labor force because it tended to push wages down. So capitalists often use women as, um, as a way to um, suppress male, male labor activism. Um, and that's why when early socialists uh, like Flora Tristan or Algis Bebels or Clara Zetkin in Germany, they said any working class movement has to unite men and women together so that the capitalists can't use them against each other. So that's the first thing. The second thing is more recently to um, respond to this question of liberal feminism is that for capitalism, for a brief period of time, uh, patriarchy was the enemy. So patriarchal control of the family did not allow capitalism to penetrate the family to the extent that it wanted. Capitalism can sell more stuff when we are atomized from each other. And so this is uh, uh, Nancy Fraser, who's a philosopher at, at um, the New School. She writes about the um, interesting uh, alliance between feminism and capitalism. And what she shows is that when capitalism needed an ally to help destroy patriarchy, or at least lessen the influence of patriarchy in our societies, feminists are only too happy to help out, right? So they don't challenge capitalism, but they do challenge patriarchy. And that actually benefits capitalism in some ways, um, especially when it's looking to expand markets by atomizing people and breaking up families. Okay, so thank you for your answer. So anyone who wants to ask uh, Professor Kasi can type in the comment section. Okay. Um, yeah, we have next question from Jirapriya Saibu. How is capitalism destroying a affectionate relationship between people? Could you please give an example on this? Sure. So, you know, one of the things that I talk about in the book is um, a website in the United States called seeking.com, uh, where um, young people become sugar babies and they sign up for a monthly fee to spend time with sugar daddies or sugar mommies, but mostly they're sugar daddies. And what, what, what I find, you know, um, I have spoken to many students who have done this. And so when you're young and uh, you're trying to get through university, for instance, you have bills to pay in the United States, you have incredible amount of student loans. So instead of spending time with people your age uh, or spending time with, um, you know, uh, members uh, ro forming romantic relationships with your peers for free, right? Because this is like, you know, forming relationships is, um, is not a market activity. A lot of my students make the decision to, instead of the time that they would otherwise spend on forming a relationship with a peer, they sell that time to a sugar daddy for money in order to meet their basic needs. And I think what that does in, in, um, in the case of, at least in, in, in the cases that I'm aware of, is that it makes it much more difficult for us to then turn around and share our relationships for free later. Because we start to think of our emotions and our affections as commodities to be sold. And so much like you know, Marx talks about the alienation of, of labor from the product of their labor, I think that what capitalism is doing to many of us is alienating us from our own emotions, alienating us from our own affections. So that by exploiting our affections, by making our emotions into commodities, we ourselves are becoming kind of distanced from these feelings. And I can give all sorts of examples of this, but we see this very clearly in, um, in the United States and, and in, I would say in advanced industrialized countries in Europe because you have an epidemic of loneliness. People are very, very lonely and isolated these days because of this alienation that's going on. But you also see things like the birth rate is plummeting. People are not getting married. People are not having kids. People are not having sex, right? In, 
in the United States um, and, and in, even in places like Sweden, right? You have, um, we have studies that show that younger people are not having sex at the same rates as their parents did or their grandparents did at the same age. So, so what is going on now? Some people blame technology. Some people say it's because you're on the phone or you're on Facebook Live watching lectures or whatever you're doing <laughs> instead, of, instead of spending time with your friends and forming relationships. But I actually think a lot of it has to do with contemporary capitalism and the fact that young people are constantly thinking of themselves as a brand, you know, personal branding. You have to have a platform. You have to have a Twitter hashtag. You have to be out there constantly contributing to your cultural capital, your social capital online so that you can get a job, so that you can live. And we're increasingly becoming alienated from ourselves in a way that I think is profoundly undermining our ability to forge authentic relationships with each other. It's that's a like fascinating answer. And yeah, let's move to like the next question. This is kind of funny, but uh, okay. So from uh, Mr. Sikalakum, <laughs> yeah, okay. How do I so, convert my girlfriend to a socialist? <laughs> tell, tell her to read the book. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but, you know, but also, um, I do think that, you know, sometimes ideas are really powerful and it might be reading a book it might be watching a video it might be talking to friends um, people find their way to political um, open-mindedness in different ways but um, I don't I think that that's like a lovely sentiment right like I'm going to share something that I know you know maybe conversion is not the the right <laughs> word here but like yeah. I'm going to share my passion with you. I've learned these really cool things. I mean, that's what I'm. That's what I do. It's like I I learned these things and I want to tell somebody about it. I mean, my, everybody does that, right? So, yeah. so share what you know because people are people are are going to be attracted to your passion and your interest, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> Next question. Do you have any examples of mainstream economics theories that can be used to oppress women in a capitalistic society? Well, um, obviously, I mean, boy, I could go on here forever. Um, so so I'll just give you one example, right, which is the yeah. way we measure GDP, right? So gross domestic product is a measure of economic transactions within an economy. You know, it's government spending and consumption, right? Um, but it doesn't include women's unpaid labor. It always has excluded women's unpaid labor. So it doesn't matter how hard women are working in the home. It doesn't matter how what services they're providing for their children, for their elderly parents, for their relatives. None of that counts as having economic value unless it is paid in the market. And so when we think about GDP, you know, or, or GDP per capita, these measures, these are key economic indicators that are used to measure economic growth for all of our countries, what we do is we basically just ignore everything that women do unless they do it in the market. And um, in, in March, I think it was March 6, again, in the New York Times, I wrote uh, an op-ed with a colleague of mine at the New York Times where we used some Oxford, uh, Oxfam data and we showed that if women globally were paid for uh, their unpaid labor at the minimum wage in their countries, the total economic value of women's labor for one year in 2018 would be $1.5 trillion. Or no, I'm sorry. No, that was for the United States was 1.5. Globally, it was $10.9 trillion. So the fact that we don't even consider that at all in our economic measure is a way very precisely that mainstream economic theories oppress it, contributes to the oppression of women in a capitalist society. Yes, certainly agree with that. So <laughs> that we have less time. So I think it, uh, there's going to be 
two more questions. Okay. Okay. So I'll be quick. Yeah, it's, it's interesting question for me. Uh, what about a website like Olifants? Liberals would say that it is women's consent to make money of their bodies. What do you think about this? So Olifants is a website that uh, you can like register and let the user or customer to subscribe and see their like ex exclusive content and mostly like some is like a nude or porn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I would just say that OnlyFans, the website takes 20%, two zero percent of all money. That's one fifth of the revenue that goes to women who are posting on that site. They are making a lot of cash. It's very exploitative. Furthermore, OnlyFans has a pyramid scheme so that if a woman um, recruits other women, right, to be on uh, under her, she gets a portion of their revenue, I believe, for the first year that they're on the website. So OnlyFans is a classic example of exploitation for, in a capitalist perspective. Now, I'm, I think that people who are on OnlyFans, if you know, if they're if they're having fun and they're enjoying it, there's no judgment on this, right? But this is, you know, it is essentially a digital exploitation platform for, um, you know, uh, entrepreneurial women, right? But it it's still twenty percent is a huge cut that that website is taking. So again, liberal feminists might say, oh, well, this is just women empowering themselves and taking control of their bodies and using them to, for their own purposes. But the fact that there's this economic exploitation that's going on behind the scenes should not be ignored. Okay, so I think this is the last question for today from Kunathanan Niko Warin Uh There have been ongoing developments of disenfranchised young men who feel that they are losing out as women begin to take more active roles in the society. How do we convince them that the enemy is not women, but rather capitalism? Exactly. And this is so important because we see this in the United States. Not We see it with women, but we also see it with ethnic and racial and religious minorities, right? So capitalism is very, very good. I think, you know, Lenin is attributed as saying, Fascism is capitalism in decay. When the economic system starts to crumble, the first thing that economic elites do is to provide to point to scapegoats. They say it's it's not um, it's not the economic system. It's because you know uh, certain people are coming over the border to take your jobs. It's not the economic system. It's because women are taking a bigger role in society. It's not the economic system. It's because Muslims are coming into your country. So we've seen, we, anybody who knows anything about the history of the 20th century knows that this is a classic strategy of capitalism in crisis, is to blame other people for the failures of the economic system. So I do think that that's you know, one of the most important things that socialist feminists can do is to reach out to men and to say, we are not your enemies. We are fighting for a better, a just, equitable, and sustainable world together with you, not against you. If we join together, we have so much power. Don't let them divide us. And I think that the problem is, is so many of these disenfranchised men, you know, they go on YouTube and they end up in these sort of, you know, manosphere um, rabbit holes where they watch all these videos about women taking away their rights and women feminists doing all these evil things. And what it, what it does is it blinds them to the fact that the economic precarity that they feel is from capitalism. It's not from women because women are feeling precarious too. So as we think about the, the world going forward, I think that, you know, I do think that liberal feminism has this problem of demonizing men, of making men feel like they're the enemy by focusing too much or exclusively on the patriarchy. And instead, we need to broaden our understanding of the ways that our societies oppress people, both men and women, and encourage young men, particularly, to see women as their allies. 
to see women as their sisters in a fight for a, a better world, for a, a better future. And I think that that's the way to reach out to men who feel this, the same way that I said, you know, that if you want to convert your girlfriend to socialism, <laughs> you need to share your passion for it. I think that women also need to reach out to these young men and say, hey, look, we are not your enemy. We are your allies in this struggle. Um, so, um, I'd like to, um, sell the book. Okay. <laughs> so, like, if you, if you know, if you want to know how to, how socialism is better than capitalism in terms of sex, like, you really need, you really have to read this book, or you want to turn your girlfriend into a socialist, also give this book to her on Christmas. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so this book is all about, you know, um, um, about like economic e equality and about you know your about how economic system can affect your intimate relationship like it can i think from le leading from leading this book you can even conclude that capitalism capitalism is capitalism makes us you know make us have a loveless life <laughs> make us you know uh, make a girl don't have any boyfriend or yes and because um i'm quite ex exciting i'm sorry and so yeah you really have to read this book if you want to find out how socialism is better than capitalism and how to you know if and yes if you want to convert your girlfriend so give her this book and um thank you for this amazing talk like yes um you know there are there are not many socialist talk in Thailand, so this is like one of the few, the very, very few discussions going in Thailand, and it will be useful because right now there are protests, there are protests out there to um, fight against the dictator, mm -hmm. the dictator government, and you know it like it's it's been so it's been ages that we that we have lacked the the idea of you know. The idea and the dreams, and this is like, this is like one of the first times that we are able to dream something beyond the current system. And I think it's time. I think it's like it's time we, you know, we we propose or we we try to make people dream more. And you know, this book will, of course, um, expand your dream and. Because you know the current system, you know, cancels our future like every single day, and we need like we need a new system, we need a new dream, we need a new possibility. So, um, this <laughs> this book will help you dream more, <laughs> dream bigger. Yes. Yeah. Great. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. So thank you so much. I've heard like you. You've got like a podcast channel? Here. Yes, I do. I have a podcast on Alexandra Kollontai. So actually, if you're interested in learning about socialist feminism through the lens of one of the major socialist feminist theorists of the 19th and 20th centuries, it's ak47.buzzsprout.com. So if people are interested, I encourage them to listen to that podcast. Yeah. Sometimes my daughter does it with me and we have a lot of fun. Uh Thank you so much. So, so finally, I, I would like to say that, um, so yeah, of course, there's, there would be some uh, like agreement and disagreement on, on, on what uh, Professor Kristen have said. So we strongly encourage everybody to engage with this live and yeah, you can write an article to criticize or to support um, Professor Kristen. Yes, yeah, just, just to make the like just to make a progress in our thinking and our thoughts in Thai society. And yeah, I would like to um promote the tomorrow session for this program. Okay. Um tomorrow we have a talk about the situation of the Uyghurs in China and that yeah, we're gonna discuss how can we help them to, as we have known about the one China policy that the Communist Party of China tried to implement. And yes, of course, it, it, it affects um, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and also Thailand in terms of economy and yeah, and so on. So yeah, let's 
meet again tomorrow for those who are in for those who are interested so we thank you very much um uh, professor Kristen, for today's station thank you um, and thank good you, luck sir. this is a great series uh, good luck with the rest of the series i'm very delighted yeah. that i was able to participate yeah thank you so much all right bye-bye bye-bye okay